What's it like being here in the day of first hot fire for the engine after years and decades for you of imagining a system like this? Oh, I'm, I'm not too sentimental. <laughs> uh, I just want it to work. Pass fighter in three, two, one. Man's age-old dream of flight becomes a reality. One, zero, all engines running. I love the smell of jet fuel. <laughs> My name is Ian Brooke. Company is Astro Mechanica, building new supersonic aircraft powered by a new kind of jet engine. How many flight hours do you think you have at this? Oh, I mean, you know, I've got 1,500 hours. All right, good to go. Santa Rosa Tower, Diamond Twin, November 63, Golf Hotel, ready to go, 1 4, like a straight out, southeast now. 760 Golf Hotel, Santa Rosa Tower, hold short of runway 1 4, top 3. Go to 55 kids, Juliet, runway 1 4, top 3, taxi be alpha. 55 kilo, Juliet, Santa Rosa. When you're up here doing this, it's very clear, you know, there's no like hard lines between anywhere, this is all just earth. Being up here and seeing this, it sort of it puts things in a more correct scale. I think in it, it's like if if you the screen for too long, or just like inside a building for too long, this is a version of touching grass. Where you're always like touching the sky. <laughs> uh, it's good, good to do, good for the soul. I'm Matthew Perkins. I lead the electrical engineering and software teams here. We're trying to make a new jet engine that enables uh, supersonic flight in a sustainable, fuel-efficient fashion. What's unique about our engine is that we're splitting it into basically two parts. Um, one is the compressor and propulsive side of it, and one is the like turbine and generator side of it. And the way in which we're coupling them together is taking two electric motors. Um, the turbine spins one motor, acts as a generator, the other motor spins the compressor um, and we connect the two with basically just like cables and a battery. What that enables us to do is run both of those halves in different operating regimes depending on the speed of flight. So we can optimize the engine to run at um, you know Mach 1 just as well as it runs at like Mach 3, which historically has been kind of the major drawback of supersonic flight is that when it's going really fast it's either really inefficient or if it's efficient when it's going really fast it's horribly inefficient when it's going slow. Our engines should be efficient across the full operating regime, which is the really cool thing about it. The way this works, we burn fuel in a generator. Uh, that generates the electrical power over here. That electrical power is then used in this system, so we're just testing this end of things because this is a really new piece. So this is sort of the initial cold mode. It behaves just like a turbofan. And then what we're testing today for the first time is we're going to introduce fuel here in the combustor. And that allows the system to behave both as that turbofan cycle and then going past that to be the jet cycle. That combination of low speed and high speed uh, capability and efficiency, it increases the range pretty dramatically over anything that's existed before. So you need an engine to be this efficient to be able to do nonstop Trans-Pacific. So if you just took like a Concorde, for instance, and re-engined it with this sort of architecture, you get about 61% more range, uh, which is significant. So Concorde could do more than the Atlantic. This can do the Pacific. When I was 13, I started building model planes. And something that was like really clear in that world was the gap between what was technically possible and what was, I guess, readily available were like, it was a really wide gap. And this was like deeply annoying to me. And it was just like obvious that you could have an aircraft company making these new, better airplanes. And so that was always in the back of my mind. The stuff that we had with model aircraft, these electric motors, they were just way, way better. But the batteries sucked. That's always, and it still is a limiting factor. But there was something to this of like how much better electric systems could be. So over time, as I sort of like advanced as a pilot, aircraft builder, got to flying jets, I had built up like enough tree of knowledge that I had on how to build and design things. I could plot a path of how to really solve a bunch of these issues that we had in, in aerospace, specifically sort of more on the, the private jet end of things. We started with the engine first. I mean, planes are built around engines. It's what made powered flight possible. And so, it was only from having an insight on a new way to advance supersonic propulsion 
that I that are like actually make supersonic plane. So the first one was I realized a new way to make the turbo electric adaptive engine. And that solves efficiency, like technical limitations, but it doesn't fully solve the economic challenge. You know, you're still gonna consume a lot more energy as you go faster. And so the next part of this, which came in from rockets, you know, they're all switching from kerosene-based fuels, which is, you know, essentially just jet fuel, to methane-based fuel. So, you know, rockets use methalox. And this is actually just, you know, this is LNG. And interestingly, you know, LNG is a tenth the price of jet fuel. One advantage we have in starting on our project now is that uh, we don't have a ton of like kind of the legacy history. So when you think about modern day electronics, we have all these cool like gadgets, you know, your iPhone is an amazing piece of technology and we're basically planning to leverage that level of technology in our plane. So things like when you talk in plane world, people are like, oh, is your engine controller like actually fully digitally controlled, which is kind of like almost an insane question in like 2024. So kind of from the ground up building for modern electronics and like modern software practices. We're able to utilize like a bunch of the electric motor technology that's getting developed for the EV market, but also for like the EV racing market, right? So the coolest part is we have these wild like electric motors right there that are like carbon fiber. They're super lightweight, they're super high performance, and they're like really compact. And so it's kind of this perfect time to be able to use that. We first, you know, came out showing what we call now our, our Gen 1 engine. And that was proving the especially new part of what we're doing of using electric compression for supersonic propulsion. Uh, you know, those generating roughly a Mach 3 exhaust velocities. That was the first thing. We then built what we call our Gen 2. That was to show, all right, this is behaving like a very efficient turbo fan cycle, electric fan cycle. Now the thing that we're demoing is Gen 3. This is the first to marry those two things. It's the efficient supersonic high speed cycle combined with the high efficiency subsonic cycle into a single engine where it's fully demonstrated the adaptive capability in one, one system. Next engine is basically the first kind of engine that size that could actually be useful on a plane. So it's like a full thing. We're going to be trying to test fire and basically demonstrate the technology um, and, you know, presumably learn a lot along the way. Today is the first day we're going to be going for hot fire on that engine demonstrating that full, full performance. What's it like being here after years and decades for you of imagining a system like this? Oh, I'm, I'm not too sentimental. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to work. Go time. Another test. We're going to staircase up with the fuel valve and we're not going to wipe the igniter at all. We're not going to oh, yeah, put any need, igniter. You need full flow on the yeah. yeah. So we're gonna do a cold, one to cold flow where we sweep through a bunch of different positions then have a better sense of how much to open that servo valve. And you wanna do a same sequence this time of have the igniter go once it's already flowing? Yeah. We are gearing up for another test, trying it at slightly different fuel ramp profile that we're gonna throttle up uh, a bit more slowly and hit a couple different set points that we think are gonna be uh, lower power but perhaps a bit easier to ignite. So. We'll see. Making some racket. Neighbors are not going to be excited about it. <laughs> nice. Hey. Hey. Congrats. Yes. <laughs> oh, no? You hit the manual board. Yeah. This is supposed to be the burger. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's always kind of exciting to see that initial didn't blow up. So <laughs> we're at a good starting point. Uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know, uh, there was bets being placed. So it's uh, it's always nerve wracking. I don't want to lose a bet. <laughs> so, uh, I don't have a lot of money, so I can't really lose. I got to win these bets. <laughs> 
everything that we're doing is predicated on the functionality of this engine, that it is going to be the new capable thing that it is. And that was the very first thing that we set out to prove and what we've done and what we're demonstrating now. So now we can go on to the work of building a relatively conventional supersonic aircraft as much as that can be a thing, because the engine is what had to change. Really now the path ahead is first prove the engine. And when we build this aircraft, build an unmanned aircraft. Then once we get familiar with this technology, we're actually out there you know, flying it, a thing much like we'll eventually have people. Then we can go through the very long process of going through FAA certification. I would say we expect to probably be flying something at most two years to get to this supersonic flight demonstrator. And our version of this is gonna be pretty, pretty big and substantial. I'm gonna be flying an experiment on one of these, certainly inside of five years. When first paying passengers can be going on something like this, probably more in the range of seven to 10 years out. So for when we get to these first passenger flights, that's, we're still gonna be small. This is gonna be like tens of flights per day, maybe. Then you go like, start to go up the ladder of, okay, we get a little bit bigger. We go for like people paying first class. Uh, you know, now you're maybe in the, you know, the hundreds of flights per day. Then eventually you scale this up to where you're doing thousands of flights per day. That's, that's the ultimate destination. And you just keep, you have to go bit by bit. Do you think we're kind of living through a new aviation renaissance with all the new companies' I innovation? Not yet. We're close, but there hasn't really... I mean, I think this is the point of my company. Like, we haven't had a catalyst to really change this yet. But the future that we'll have really will be... It's the one that we're going to bring about. Uh, the accessibility, not of, like, flying at this scale. This isn't, you know, made for scalable, really. It's, it's like the jet level of flying, but made personal. And, and it's, it's not this like elitist thing or something like that. It's like everybody gets to have that. I feel like so much of our existence is defined by sort of time separation. It's going to feel like there's just that much more of the world that is accessible to you. Proceed as requested to the south run of beer area via Alpha. Next time we see you, we'll be breaking the sound barrier at our own airplane. <laughs>